Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get right back into our teaching. Father, thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. And above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit. We deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping, thanking you in advance for anointing every ear, mind, heart, and soul to receive the engrafted word. We welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation even as the Spirit wills. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory. I thank you, Father, for anointing this vessel of clay to do just that, to minister life to your people, boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth, that it will not return to you void, but will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, last time we were together during our midweek time, I was talking about what prayer is, the power of prayer, and I want to pick up on that again. In fact, before I even get back into the lesson, let me make a comment in effect to the prayer that I pray when we're opening up this program, for example. In fact, it's a prayer that I pray as I open up virtually any service that I'm teaching or ministering or preaching in. And, you know, somebody might think that's sort of a vain repetition. That's not the same thing. No, it's a prayer that is oriented in line with the Word of God. I am literally invoking God's presence to do the things and to express the things that you hear in that prayer. Certainly, certainly we give God thanks and praise right at the opening. You know, that's faith. I mean, we're already thanking God for things we don't see, even some things we may not know that are coming, uh, because God can certainly get involved or intercede in any particular position uh, through what we call the manifestation of prophecy, by the Holy Spirit to speak unto men unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. I can't tell you how many times that has happened. Studying the Word, praying, all of that is typical. Uh, it should be typical of everybody that's a citizen of the kingdom of God. Because to be honest with you, when you do pray, and I want you to open your Bibles to Luke 18.1. I'm going to go back. That's sort of our foundational text uh, for this teaching where uh, Luke's narrative opens it up. But as I said, in the course of that prayer, again, we're invoking God to get involved in what is about to happen. And by becoming built up in that and aligning ourselves with God's word, we are then in a position to be made available to his spirit for whatever he may wish to do. I've come in prepared with an outline uh, of study and meditation ready to focus on a particular thing, and then suddenly God says, well, you know, changes that direction. <laughs> Should I say don't try this at home? But no, you see, God definitely has the right to get involved. It's his church. It's not mine. It's his. This is the Lord's church, <laughs> and Jesus is Lord. Praise God. So he can intervene or intercede at any place or at any point that he wants. I know prior to COVID, you know, while we were dealing with, shall we say, maybe a little bit more, I guess you say you can't get more structured than the way uh, the pandemic has reoriented a bunch of things. But nevertheless, in typical services, at any given time, the Lord could come in and get involved in that service, speak through me different things. Uh, the manifestation of prophecy is an enablement of the Holy Spirit that enables me to minister in my own known tongue, my own known language, by virtue of direct revelation from the Spirit of God. So, in other words, I become, if you would please, the channel through which God begins to say some things that I didn't necessarily have on the agenda. And that's all right. Praise God. You know it's God. You cooperate with that. You flow with that. And I'm just saying that prayer, study, meditation, you know, just continuing in his word. And again, I want to remind people when I say things like that, I'm not saying to you you're in a 24-7 of nonstop prayer and Bible reading and so forth. Uh, I don't really know anybody that does that. 
Uh, I think about what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. What did he say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So God is saying, you know, get your priorities in order. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, he doesn't go on. Now, obviously, God leaves room for whatever second, third, and so forth. And there are those things that come after that that we have to deal with. If we were, shall I say, simply chained to seeking first the kingdom of God, or it, let's just leave first out of it. If we're just chained to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, well, that, that'd be a nonstop journey, wouldn't it? If we couldn't break into any other things, we we wouldn't appropriately prioritize the other matters of our lives. We have families, we have jobs, we have other commitments and obligations, we're volunteering. There's so many things that are going on. So God is not a nonsensical God. He has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I find myself, uh, you know, saying that passage scripture over and over and over again uh, to people because some things that they're doing do not come from a sound mind. Uh, but it may be their own mind or might be somebody else's mind, but it's not necessarily sound. So we need to watch that. But by staying in the word and letting the word dwell in us, it, we stay aligned. And by staying led, being continually led by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's an interesting arrangement because, you know, we can be and stay continually being led <clears throat> by the Spirit all through the day, all through the night. Now, when you're sleeping, it doesn't take much leading to do that. All you have to do is sleeping and tired, and you'll sleep. But for the most part, during our waking hours and during the time that we have to focus on our attentions on different matters, uh, the Holy Spirit's leading and guidance is, is critical. It's critical for us. He has all, everything uh, downloaded for us that, that we really need. God's timing, uh, God's word, God's instructions. He is that ultimate conduit that helps us uh, to understand those things and flow in those. Now, let's go back to our, our foundational verse, and that's Luke 18.1. Remember, I took some time to spend on this a little bit, but this is an opening narrative. Dr. Luke, one of the Jesus men, says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So Luke says, here's the reason why Jesus told this parable. You know, he, he wrote this down under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He knew that Jesus' teaching of the parable of the unjust judge had actually been done. So when Luke went back in to record what he witnessed, what he heard, at the end of it, and that's how Luke's mind worked. He said, now what is the reason that Jesus told this story? Sometimes when we read the scripture, it looks like Luke got ahead of Jesus, but no. Jesus had presented this parable of the unjust judge, and Luke understood, came to the conclusion, and certainly by being uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, came up and put this, shall we say, look ahead. He spoke this parable to them to this end. Here's the purpose for which he spoke it. And he said and that, that purpose was that men ought always to pray and not to faint. That's very revealing. That's very telling. And I'll explain that to you. Why? Why is it so revealing, Pastor? Why is it so telling? Because Luke is saying when Jesus taught this parable, he's saying that we need to persevere. And, you know, this is certainly applied where prayer is concerned. But there are also other spiritual functions that are concerned. There are many intangibles that I encourage the people of God to master, intangibles. Uh, clues to those intangibles are in Paul's writing in Philippians 4, 8, where he says, now, you need to think on these things. And he talked about whatsoever things are true and honest and virtuous, there'd be any praise, good report, all those are intangible things. Nothing we can go into the store and say, I'll take a box full of this or a pound of that or an ounce of the other. No, these are intangibles that we need to nurture and manage and present. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, think about fruit. Fruit grows on the branches of trees. 
But in order to really get the fruit to grow and to get it good and right, well, there's some things that we need to do. Fruit has to be cultivated. There's a process in, in developing and growing fruit. These guys that have these big uh, citrus groves and uh, the pecan groves here in South Georgia, the peach groves and things, hey, th those guys, the farmers who tend to those things, they're out there doing some things. They're making sure that the trees are healthy, that they're irrigated, that they have enough water. Uh, there may be other uh, ingredients that help to promote. They have to fertilize those trees. And then, you know, they're looking at the fruit. There's all kinds of enemies that have fruit, bugs and all kinds of things. Things want to get in there and consume the fruit before it's picked and, you know, sent out for harvest and then distributed to people to eat. So, so there are a number of things that happen even before the harvest. But they had to master those practices. And, they, and you know what? They, they are practices. They have to to do them. Here again, we see a parallel point because Luke said he spoke this parable unto them to this end or the objective, the, the ultimate goal that Jesus was trying to accomplish in telling this story was that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And when he says always to pray, that is to say we as God's people, we as citizens of the kingdom of God, I'll say it this way, whenever issues come up, whenever resistance presents itself, whenever ob objects are in our way of any kind, we default to prayer. We don't default to worry. We don't default to fear. We default to prayer. You know, default means the place you, you tend to go back to or the starting point and so forth. So we as citizens of God's kingdom, when issues arise and present themselves, rather than defaulting to worry and fear and anxiety and anger, which are also intangible things that people can sadly develop and nurture to pretty dramatic and remarkable presentations. No, we don't default to those things. We should default to prayer. And that's what he said. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. After all, this parable of the unjust judge is a story about one issue. Now, I've been over this. I'm not going to go over this again. I just want to make a commentary here. Jesus is telling us a single scene type of a story. We, we have the characters in there, and there's only two, the judge and this woman, neither of whom we have any resume. We don't have any credits or anything on them. We don't know who, you know. How old they are, all this kind of thing. None of the demography, none of the specifics, just these two characters. And Jesus said, here's the whole deal. This woman said to the judge, avenge me of my adversary. So she had an issue. She had a problem. And obviously, the only remedy for it was going to come through the court. So you got this unjust judge. That, that's the only, uh, shall I say, reference we have. That's the only clue we have that this judge, is unjust. And the reason he's unjust is because, as Jesus said it, the man didn't fear God, means he had no respect for God, and neither did he have any respect for men. He didn't care about guys. He's just in there doling out justice as he sees fit to dole it out. And of course, ultimately, we come to understand that God is not an unjust judge, and Jesus definitely underscored that point. But the real point of this, and of course what Luke said, that he spoke this parable unto them to this end, Luke caught it really quickly. He said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And that's what that woman did in a type. This woman, when she didn't get justice after her first presentation, took a break, came back, and made another presentation. She didn't get justice on the second round. She took a break, came back. <laughs> she, she kept demanding justice from the judge. The judge said, Finally, you know, she came so much, she, the judge said, listen, this woman is about to wear me out. I got other cases to deal with. Uh, I got, I want to go home and see my family or whatever it was. You know, I'm just putting some augmentation in there for us to really understand it in a three-dimensional setting. Uh, but, but you understand, if, if he doesn't care, if he isn't respecting God and he doesn't have any regard for men, uh, you know, he's totally focused on himself and his own business. 
And so that's the reason why Jesus said he was unjust. And though he was unjust, he said, you know, I'm tired of this woman. She is wearing me down. She will wear me out. This woman has no quitting sense. That's the whole point of prayer. No quitting sense. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. When we have confrontations, when we have issues and challenges, our default setting should be let's take this into prayer. And we have so many tools in the prayer treasure chest, if you will. There's all types of prayer. I want you to go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, of course, this is the place where you find the whole armor of God. And Paul, I'll read it in from verse 10. Paul says, now finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I, I love that prefix right there. I, I love that introduction. Paul said, now finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Paul, of course, says, put on the whole armor of God. Naturally, you're not going to find another verse that ever tells you to take it off. But I want you to go down in this with me here where Paul begins to explain we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places or in the heavenlies. And uh, there, there's some rank and file there in the realm of the spirit that is of a demonic nature. And this is what Paul is describing in Ephesians chapter 6. And so he says, Wherefore, take unto you, verse 13, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand or withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Paul says, there's no need in you grabbing carnal weaponry, fleshly weaponry or defense systems, because they are basically inert and impotent against spiritual onslaughts. And yet there's a lot of people that feel like if that's what they do, that will resolve their problems, resolve their issues. I mean, put them away and so forth and so on. No, what they actually do is multiply the, the challenges and the issues that are presenting themselves. Amen. They, the Bible says, he that soweth to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Never forget that statement. They that sow to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. That's the only, that's the best the flesh can deliver. He said, but they that sow to the spirit will of the spirit reap life everlasting. That's, that's a spiritual law. That's the way that it works. That's the system. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, or another way of putting that, is God's way of doing things. And what did he say? Results will happen. All these things shall be added unto you. What things? If you go back to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus explained the things. He said, everybody's looking for shelter. Everybody's looking for a roof over their head. Now, they didn't have automobiles in those days, but I imagine people were looking for beasts of burden to ride on. Mules, donkeys, horses, whatever, whatever was available. You know, fishermen wanted boats. As I said, they didn't have autom automotive products back in that time. But Jesus basically is saying, listen, everybody's out to have the advantages that they feel they need uh, to live in this life. And, but he said, but if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things, or whatever the things are that you have need of, will be added unto you. Jesus is revealing a very powerful principle there. He says, when you take matters into the spirit, it, it, let me back up a minute. When you take the matters, the issues that are at hand that you have the scope of dealing with, mothers, you have the scope of dealing with the rearing of your children, the care of your children, the care of your household, and then you may be working too. And so you're, you're a working mom, maybe you're a manager, maybe you're somewhere in between, whatever you are. That's your scope of operation. And this, and all the more you've got in your scope of operation uh, unfolds the possibility of issues and challenges presenting themselves. 
you know, in other words, the devil will get in there somewhere, throw a monkey wrench in the middle of it, and you're saying, man, this is not going the way I thought it should go. You know, men who are fathers and husbands and uh, businessmen or whatever you might be, again, that's the, that's the scope of your dominion, as it were. And and anything, look, when you go, oh, thank you, Jesus. It's coming a little fast, folks. I think back to the Garden of Eden. You know what? The Garden of Eden was beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. No blemish, no mess, no problem. But look, a problem arose. A big problem arose. And essentially dissembled and completely spoiled what should have been paradise. I guess that's where they get the title, book title, Paradise Lost. Yeah, well, that paradise was definitely lost. And uh, Adam and Eve sadly lost it. Uh, but you see, God gave them dominion even before the issues came. I love that because that's an important point to remember, that God blessed them. He empowered them to prosper, to do all that he commanded them to do. When God said, let's make man in our image and after our likeness, is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and he said, let them have what? Dominion. Over, you know, over the works of our hands. He said, let them have dominion, the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, the beasts of the field, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let them have dominion. It wasn't supposed to be the other way. We're not to be dominated by creation, as it were. We were supposed to be, have dominion over God's creation. No other creature was assigned that. And he said, be fruitful, <coughs> pardon me, multiply, <coughs> I beg your pardon, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And yet the devil got in there. How did he get in there? Well, the Bible tells you by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And now as we fast forward to the present in our own scope of dominion and the things we have to watch for and manage and take care of, uh, again, the same little pattern and scenarios keep coming. Listen, Jesus confronted it. Remember the Mount of Temptation experience where Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the Mount and to be tempted of the devil, and the devil tested him. And in, in, in all three components of our human corporality, he was tested in his flesh. He was tested in his soul. He was tested in the Spirit. The devil threw tests at him, and Jesus came back at the devil with the same response. He said, it is written, it is written, and it is written again. And I want to tell you something. When you're dealing with the issues that come at you in life, that's what you have to do. See, when you study and meditate on the Word of God, you're in a position to say to whatever your opposition and resistance is, hey, it is written. And you speak that word. And of course, when Luke says men ought always to pray and not to faint, you incorporate that word in your prayer. Jesus told in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, how faith works. Then in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, just the next verse, Jesus said, now here's how you work faith through prayer. And it's called the prayer of faith. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. That's how faith works through prayer. So Jesus not only explained to us how faith works, he taught us how to apply it in prayer. And I want to tell you, you can apply what the Word of God promises you in prayer. My remarks near the opening of this program, I was talking to you about my own prayer that I use or I speak before I speak to you, open up a service, if I'm preaching in a place or teaching in a place, I pray that prayer. That, that prayer sets the stage. That prayer invokes God's presence. I, I'm, I'm saying, you know, Lord, I, I welcome and invite your supernatural manifestations. God, you're, you're welcome to operate in this space and in this place. And I also am aware from studying the scripture there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, where the various manifestations of the Holy Spirit, nine of them in fact, are discussed and presented. I'm very aware when I'm asking God that, and welcoming him to manifest the supernatural in the course of our service, he can do that. Even though we're live streaming, he can do that. 
He can do that through the, the spoken word. That word becomes a rhema to you. The next thing you know, there you are, and all of a sudden there's a manifestation of God's spirit, whether it's the working of miracles, the gifts of healings, the discerning of spirits, the gift of special faith, wh whatever it may be, prophecy, diverse kinds of tongues. God begins to initiate those things and work those things, and we welcome those. God can get involved supernaturally at any time and in any way that he desires. And we ju we are just stating that. It's, it's also in that prayer, it sets us, sets us up rather for what I call a confident expectation that God will indeed, and you're going to hear it come out of me, show himself strong on the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect toward him. Now that's from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, where it says, that the, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the old, whole earth. Uh, it's First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. To show himself strong on the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect toward him. Sometimes I may incorporate into a prayer some uh, elements of Psalm 91, where it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, and my God, and in Him shall I trust. And then I may incorporate other elements out of that particular psalm. With long life will he satisfy me, which takes me over to Psalm 23, which says that <clears throat> surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I Whatever this word says, Jesus taught me I could apply how to apply faith through prayer. Well, I want to tell you something. You can apply many of the other promises, principles, and practices of God in prayer. It goes back to what Luke said. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Hey, you have, if I may so colloquialize it, you have a cabinet full, <laughs> a cabinet full of prayer weaponry. You know, some people pride themselves. They, they're, they're gun collectors or weapons collectors or whatever. They, they usually keep them in a locked cabinet, most people, you know, and, and all this kind of thing. Now, I know, don't, please don't write me any letters because I brought that up. I'm just using it as an illustration. But then why not? Did not Paul say the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They don't pertain to the flesh, but they are mighty through God to the casting down of strongholds. So we have a collection of weapons and the manifestations of the spirit are part of that. And there, there are many other things. But prayer is, is in that list. I turned it to Ephesians 6. Let's read it. What does it say? Paul goes on and says in verse 17, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take that Word. And he says, praying. How do we pray? With words. We take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And what, what do we do? We pray. We pray what? We pray the Word. Pray always. Sounds familiar. What did Luke say? Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. That's what Luke said. All right. Men ought always to pray. And so here he says, pray always with all prayer. Now, Actually, that phrase is a little bit blind. From the Greek, it says all manner or all types of prayer because there are indeed different kinds or different types of prayer. Now, what Jesus taught in Mark eleven twenty four 24 happened to be the prayer of faith. When he said, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. It's called the prayer of faith. But there are other types of prayer. There's intercessory prayer. There is the prayer of supplication and petition. Uh, there is the prayer of worship and praise. There is united prayer where people gather together. You know, usually every year, churches, church families gather together, have a time set aside for prayer with fasting. And that is, in a sense, an assembling of prayer. It's, it's united prayer. We are knit together on one accord in one place, as it were, or wherever we are, we're on one accord. We're on the same page, all right? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Oh, my goodness. These weapons are getting more and more sophisticated, but they're definitely effective in the Spirit. What does that mean? To pray with and in other tongues. That is the utterance of the Holy Spirit coming through you. He is literally using you. 
You see, that can't happen unless you lend yourself to the Holy Spirit. You have to give yourself over to him. If praying in other tongues, people may think we're speaking gibberish or some foolishness or gobbledygook. Nothing could be further from the truth. You and I are the ones that vocalize what the Holy Spirit gives utterance. The utterance is what's said, but we are the ones saying it. Whether we are praying in our known language or whether we are praying in other tongues, which is praying in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all what? Perseverance. Isn't that what Luke said? He said, now Jesus said, that under the, taught a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint, not give up. Remember the woman, the, the, the widow there in, in the courtroom? She kept coming. The judge says, she's going to wear me out. This woman doesn't have any quitting sense. She keeps coming back again and again and again. Now, Jesus said, don't even think that God is an unjust judge. He says, how much more? He said, how much more? Well, God, hear, hear and quickly respond to those that call on him night and day. Praise the Lord. So, no, God is not an unjust judge. What happens is sometimes we get a little bit uh, antsy because we're, we got God on a stopwatch. Some of us do. You know, we're like, well, God, if you don't do this in the next hour, oh, God, if you don't do this in the next day, oh, Lord, it's all going to crumble in the next month, the next year. Oh, my goodness, Lord, COVID has messed up everything. It had messed up God. It had messed up prayer. All of the weapons of our warfare are still available. Now, if you look at documentaries from the previous wars on this earth, and I've seen some of them. I've seen documentaries on the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, uh, World Wars One and Two, Korea, Vietnam, the desert conflicts. I've seen these different documentaries. And you know what? The tactics are almost the same. Of course, weaponry got a little bit more modern and sophisticated. But you know, it's amazing. God has never needed to update his arsenal. Think about that a minute. He's never had to update his arsenal. The weapons of our warfare are as he is, the same yesterday and today and forever. And that prayer is one of them. It's right here listed in this whole armor of God. He says, now you take the sword of the Spirit. I know I'm going back. I want to repeat this, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Glory to God. Prayer is a powerful tool, a powerful, <coughs> pardon me, weapon. It, it is a limitless access. I mean, it literally has the ability to bring the power of heaven on earth. You know, the Bible says there's a time where the disciples got together in a place and they prayed and said the whole place was shaken where they were praying. I like that kind of prayer. <laughs> I love that kind of prayer, prayer that shakes. You know, when we go in to pray for people, when we were visiting hospitals on a regular basis before they became fortresses because of the pandemic, or even to people's homes to pray for them, I want to tell you, I didn't want to leave out of there praying for anybody unless I almost was shaken. Now, not shaken in the sense that I'm standing there trembling and literally shaking, and, and, I, and I'm losing my balance or something like that. No, no, no. There is something that happens in the realm of the Spirit that when the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous goes forth, that brings something in that you can't describe in natural terms. You do your best. My goodness, we say, well, I felt that. Well, oh my goodness, there's something that came over me. Something's gone through this room. I can tell a difference. Something has happened. That's exactly right. That's why it says that the in book of James, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much or makes the wonder-working power of God available. It ought to move something. Something ought to shake. It can be shaken. Glory to God. What about Paul and Silas? There they are in the in Philippian jail. And the Bible says they began to sing praises and hymns and so forth. And, you know, maybe the spirit of praise and worship came upon them. And as they unleashed that, 
The Bible said that the, an earthquake hit the place, shook the jail. But that wasn't enough. It unchained everybody that was in there without a key. Now, that's real power. Now, we may be able to charge cell phones wirelessly. We may be able to do a whole bunch of little mechanical and medical marvels. But I tell you what, I haven't seen uh, a chain on somebody that, that doesn't need a key to unlock it, so to speak. You know, I'm not talking about those little car doors and things like that. Listen, you got to understand, back in those times, 2,000 years ago, and they're sitting in a prison, in a Roman, like a Roman-based prison in, in Philippi that was all under the uh, oversight of the Roman Empire, and they put those prisoners in chains. They weren't going anywhere. They were in chains. You've seen on television where prisoners are being marched into the courtrooms, and, you know, they come in there with the orange jumpsuit, and they're in chains. they got chains on their feet, chains on their hands, so they can't go anywhere or do anything. It, think about those chains. And then all of a sudden, think about you looking at the prisoners standing there in the courthouse, and, and the place just shakes. You look at your TV screen, the whole thing's going back and forth, and everything's shaking inside the courtroom, and the chains fall off, and nobody put a key to them. That's what happened in that Philippian jail because obviously some praise and worship was going up. Prayer was going up, and it, God said, hey, I'm involved. I'm involved. <laughs> I mean, that old song <laughs> by James Brown said, everybody over here, get on up. Everybody over there, get into it. Everybody right here, get involved. Uh, no, okay. Get involved. You will experience things such as this that we've been talking about by applying the power of prayer. And we're just looking at a few examples here. I mean, from cover to cover, I could show you one situation, one story after another, where the power of prayer was making things happen. I'm thinking about right now <clears throat> when King Nebuchadnezzar demanded that his wise men tell him a dream he had. Tell him what he dreamt because he forgot it. And he's demanding of these wise men, I want you all to tell me not only the interpretation of the dream, he's, I want you to tell me what it was I dreamt. And, you know, the Chaldeans and all the king's wise men would say, wait a minute, you're making a demand that nobody has asked any king of. You know, I really want to know where they got their information from. How do they know that? They hadn't been everywhere. But that's what the king accused him of, trying to make excuses and get out of, uh, you know, the demand the king made on him. He said, man, we can't do this. The king said, I'll tell you what, you will do it. If not, by this time tomorrow, all y'all are going to be dead men. Well, you know, this word got back to Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> everybody was, the whole place was just going nuts. And because the wise men said, man, we're going to be history tomorrow if we don't come up with what the king dreamt and what it meant and so forth. Because they could have told the king anything about an interpretation. They could have made up an interpretation. That's what the king knew too. He said, no, you tell me not only the, what, what interpretation is, but you tell me the dream that I dreamt. And he forgot it. So he couldn't recall it. So he couldn't give him a clue. But Daniel assembled his three friends they got together, sanctified themselves, set themselves apart, got before God. I can only imagine they were petitioning God. They were calling on God. God, the king's demand is, is hasty. It's, it, it, he's demanding this, and all of us are under the threat of death. And we invoke you, O Lord, to bring revelation. And you know what? Revelation came. It came to Daniel. It came to Daniel. Now, he got together with others that prayed with him. The Scripture doesn't say that they got the revelation of it, but the Scripture does say that Daniel got it. Daniel, God revealed to Daniel not only the interpretation of what the king dreamt, but he also revealed to Daniel what the king dreamt about. And that was the story of where the king in his dream saw a gigantic image of himself that was made up of various elements, gold. The head was gold, and there was some brass, and there was some iron mixed and mingled with clay and so forth and so on. And, and they were symbolic of the various empires that would be coming after uh, 
King Nebuchadnezzar's reign and Babylon's existence and those, the, the rest of his body and the various uh, elements that composed it were revelatory about the, the style, the type, and the endurance of the kingdoms that were to follow. Now, and so he told the king what he dreamt, and he also interpreted it. Daniel went on to tell him exactly what it meant. It's a fascinating story, and, and you need to read it. It's right there in the book of Daniel. Fascinating story. I love that story. And there's many, many, many elements in it, but I'm not teaching on that right now. I'd love to, but you need to go in there and read it for yourself. I tell you what, you're talking about boosting faith. Because what? What happened? Listen, Daniel wasn't some ex, you know, extraordinary odd fella out and the other three friends of his. No, no. But, but what did they do? They got together. Daniel's called them together. Now, he didn't pull the Chaldeans into the mix. <laughs> he, he didn't pull the other counselors into the mix. He pulled his own company in. And he said, let's pray over this matter. And perchance that God will give us the revelation of this situation. Now, they, they owed a debt to Daniel <coughs> because all the wise men were scheduled for execution if they couldn't come up with the answer. And thank God Daniel did. Daniel not only saved himself in a, in a manner of speaking and his three Hebrew buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but all the other guys, the Chaldeans and all the other Babylonian uh, members of the court, king's court, they were spared as well because if the king was not satisfied, if he didn't confirm that that dream was legitimate, that that dream was correct and accurate, and that the interpretation followed, let's just say, a flow. You know, the king isn't exactly a fool. You know, they, they wanted to throw him off, but they couldn't do it. The king definitely remembered. Once it began to unfold to him, he said, that's exactly it. And, you know, the king had nothing but good things to say about Daniel. And Daniel was all through the administrations, three administrations, Nebuchadnezzar's, Belshazzar's, and then King Darius of the Medes and the Persians, Daniel was always prominent. Daniel was always first and foremost. It was said of Daniel that there was an excellent spirit in him, not a spirit of excellence, but an excellent spirit in him. That attests to the fact that God was with Daniel, for Daniel, and God was certainly working through and in Daniel. And that, that's just remarkable. And that's Old Testament, Old Covenant. You and I are living in the New Testament times, New Covenant times, a covenant that is described as a better covenant based on better promises. Are the things that God did for Daniel and his three Hebrew friends available to us today? Certainly. If they weren't, then God wouldn't be the same yesterday and today and forever, would he? So those things are available. Now, whether or not he will dispense them through us is at his discretion. He is a sovereign God, and so those things are at his discretion. You say, well, what do we do to get involved to that degree? Well, what we do is we avail ourselves. We make ourselves available to him. In fact, Paul took it a step further. Paul said, listen, you need to desire the best gifts. If you go into the cabinet of the weapons of your warfare, Get the one you need to do the job you need it to do. That's why I, I told you there are different kinds of prayer. There's intercessory prayer. There's united prayer, I told you. The prayer of faith, the prayer of binding and loosing. There's the prayer of agreement, which is described from Matthew's gospel. It says, if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of our Father which is in heaven. Glory to God. The prayer of agreement, where two people can get in agreement is touching anything they shall ask, and, and what will happen? It shall be done. Listen, it may be a different type of prayer from the prayer, of, say, for, for, for example, of a petition or the prayer of consecration and dedication. The prayer of consecration and dedication works something like this. It's the basic phrase involved in it is you're saying, God, I don't know your specific will, over this particular matter, maybe you are figuring out a job circumstance, a decision you have to make in your household, in your business, uh, and maybe other people are involved and weighed in the balance of the decision you have to make. And you don't exactly know what to do, when to do it, or how you should go about doing it. Well, you're saying to the Lord, Lord, I come to you and I submit myself through this prayer of consecration and dedication. Now, if it's your will that I should do A, I will do it. 
However, if it's your will that I will do B, that I should do B, then I will do B. If it's your will that I should do C, uh, then I shall do C. Now, God is not the author of confusion. He's not going to leave you confused. He's not going to leave you figuring out which way is up. No. You come to him in that manner, and I tell you what, God is going to give some revelation. God is going to reveal some things, and God is going to show himself strong. He's going to let you know. He's going to give you peace. And see, the peace of God that passes all understanding is the umpire for doing the will of God. Hallelujah. I tell you what, I, I'm just excited about teaching uh, along this line, and I trust that you have received something out of it. I pray that this message has been a source of inspiration, encouragement, blessing, and practical instruction for everyday living because there is power in prayer. As the scripture says in James, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous or of a righteous man availeth much. Now, you know, when it says in the literal King James, a righteous man, but that could be a righteous woman. I, that's why I just sort of put it in a, in a collective sense, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much or makes wonder working power available. Otherwise, united prayer wouldn't make any sense. What's the point in getting together and praying if we're not expecting anything? But there is such a thing as united prayer and their <laughs> expectations are realized as a result of people gathered together. And if you get a bunch of people together praying effectually and fervently, something is going to happen. Praise God. Father, thank you for the word. And I thank you that it finds good ground into which it may be planted in the hearts of your people to bring forth fruit, yea, some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. I thank you right now, dear God, and I pray for the 100-fold in Jesus' mighty name. Let it be so. I thank you for it. Amen and amen. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you right now to join me as we go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because this is where all of it begins. It begins with Jesus. He is the Savior. He is God the Son. He is our Redeemer. He is our soon coming King. That's where it all begins. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes wherever you are, and let's pray this prayer together. Whoever you are, this will help you receive Jesus in your life and say, Dear God, in heaven I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin, is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive the, hallelujah, glory be to God. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer with us, congratulations. Welcome into the family of God. And now you are officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven.